Welcome to this special episode of Talk Commerce Tech Edition. Talk Commerce, a Tech Edition special, where we talk about how merchants, agencies, and developers experience commerce. This week, we interview Aaron Sheehan with DEG Digital. We discuss Magento Solutions Specialist, or now called Adobe Certified Expert, Adobe Commerce Business Practitioner. We discuss how important the role of a solution specialist is for any agency building an Adobe Commerce solution. We also talk about and mispronounce Hufa or Haifa, or wherever you're from and however you pronounce it. I'd love to know. There's so much more to this episode, and it is a must listen. Magento Creative, partnering with the client to help fulfill their strategic growth, serving the world as an Adobe Gold partner and Big Commerce Elite partner. Magento, the code of commerce. This episode is sponsored by Eway Corporation, the partner of choice for technology, infrastructure, and enterprise level digital solutions, an AWS Select Consulting Partner, Eway Corporation, forward together. My name is Brent Peterson, and I'm your host. Please remember to subscribe wherever you download your podcasts. And now, Talk Commerce. Welcome to Talk Commerce. Talk Commerce. Woo, 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 woo. I'm trying to get my sound effects to work. Uh, I have Aaron here. Um, and Aaron, why don't you go ahead and, and introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Aaron, as, as you just said. Uh, I am currently the uh, Magento dude at uh, DEG, which is uh, a digital agency in the Overland Park, Kansas City area. Um, and we're part of uh, the Dentsu uh, Global Network of Agencies. Uh, I've been in the Magento community for guess about six and a half years or so um back to the you know not to the yo and roy days but to the the ebay uh x x commerce you know the fabric days certainly um and uh been at a couple of agencies prior to this and um live in uh springfield missouri which is strategically located basically in the middle of nowhere it's a steel line from tj so Right. That's me. Yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So today I thought we could talk a little bit about solution specialists and how imp- how that role is important in in a Magento project, but really in in any e commerce project. And maybe we could t- we could educate the client a little bit on why that role is important, but then also educate an agency on how a solution specialist plays such an important role in the complete project cycle or build or however you want to describe that. Yeah, absolutely. And this is near and dear to my heart because I, this is how I started my career in the Magento world as a, as a solution specialist. Uh, I took the M1 exam at Imagine in 20, I don't know, some year, 2015, I think, maybe. Um, and uh, no, so, and I, I, keep hiring more solution specialists for our our team over here because I find the position absolutely integral to delivery. Um, and I think one of the big reasons is when you, if you're a merchant and you get Magento, it's a big fully featured platform. It's not a toy platform. It's not Woo, it's not Shopify. It's got a lot of moving parts. Um, and there's a lot that you can do with it. And there's also a large ecosystem of extensions and pre-built, you know, solutions for problems that exist. Um, and sometimes if you have, if you, if you, if you, if you as a business owner have a technical problem and you express it directly to your developers, um, developers will build a solution for your problem. Sometimes that's not necessary. In fact, actually a lot of times that isn't necessary. There is something already there that will solve the problem. And it simply requires reading the docs and understanding adoption and understanding how to map the business problem to the platform that you're already paying for. So having a solution specialist is really having someone who is an advocate for the use of the platform as much as possible. Your solution specialist should be there to dig in on what you already get for free effectively via your license or just because you have the open source version um, and should be able to tell you what needs to be customized 
versus what just needs to be configured and delivered. And that's a big part of an ROI discussion, right? Because Brent, I'm sure you've had the conversation with merchants before where someone says, I want a loyalty program or I want um, coupon, I want a coupon feature. Um, and if you, if you start from a white sheet of paper and say, I'm going to write down everything I can think of that I want my loyalty program to do, for instance, you can have a pretty big sheet of paper pretty quickly. And then what happens a lot of times, right? You, you, they start going to webinars, they start going to pitches, they start talking to vendors. Um, do you have this? Do you have that, right? Um, the, our, the expense grows. Nobody thought to go back to the original platform and say, hey, you know, maybe we don't want to spend, I don't know, five thousand dollars a month for some really, you know, nice high-end loyalty program. Maybe would we get it? Would we get ROI out of it? Maybe, right? What if we What if we went back to old reliable? What if we went back to the platform and said, what do I get? What do I get for free? What can I pilot as a test to see if there's interest in a loyalty program? And it doesn't cost me any money, right? It doesn't cost me any money to implement. I'm, have you had that experience where, where you're talking mm -hmm. to a merchant and they've convinced themselves they need some top-end solution for something and are totally unaware that Magento has that feature? Yeah, definitely. And, there, and there, there's, there, is a, there is a subset of project managers that don't know every feature as well. And there are oftentimes uh, project managers or even merchants who insist on something like that. And then later on decide, oh, well, I wish you would have just told me RMA is built in and I wouldn't have gone and did an RMA program that's a SaaS based. And now I'm suddenly spending, like you said, $5,000 a month for an RMA program when we could use the one that's already there. Right. RMA, gift cards, some of these things that are built into commerce that aren't part of, uh, that aren't part of the open source platform are definitely some things that we see on an ongoing basis that merchants are asking for. And unfortunately, there are times when you have a new project manager or a junior project manager, and they're dealing with the client and the client insists on getting something quickly and the project manager says yes, and the developer says, okay, and boom, it's in there. And then suddenly everybody's saying, why did this happen? And I think it goes back to the fact that there isn't there always has to be this oversight of this architect or this solution specialist who's helping everybody to better understand the project and sometimes slowing down to do some of that analysis. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And it's interesting, you said, you, you, you mentioned project manager several times and I, I'm kind of curious. Um, solution specialist is a certification, right? It's a, that you get from, from Adobe now. Um, what what do those usually are those usually project managers at at Wagento or um, do you have a dead, like a PA or an architect role or like how do you deliver because there's lots of ways to do it right there's lots of potential config team configurations and, and professional roles I found that I you said there's a subset of project managers that would take that request kind of from the customer and sort of pass it on my experience has been that's actually the majority of project managers so. Um, where where are you finding technical project managers to be that gatekeeper or um is it is it usually like a, a a different person who's paired with that pm walk me through a little bit like how you're how do you how do you deploy your solution specialists uh on a project yeah so uh, that I mean, that's a great question and i i said i said subset to try to be nice um uh, <laughs> I, Apologies. I, do, yes. I, I do think that uh, a lot of times project managers are overworked and, and the, that they tend to get a lot of requests and every request can't be automatically known and every technical thing from a project manager can't be known, but the client expects that they know every one of those things. And so what I go back to is everybody needs to take a breath and slow down and, and work in the plan. And if the client works in the plan and we all uh, agree on this plan, then there is time and a breath and space to, to examine and look at what has to be done in this project. So I think the first part is, is educating the client 
and let's just say the development team on the need for this planning and long-term vision of this project and then slowing down and having a retrospect in within the project build cycle to to see what is happening and what are we putting in and is that still feasible and we can get into more we could go into this more in depth we should be doing periodic load testing against new solutions that we are implementing whether especially if there's something that uh, isn't known or isn't known at some skew count or some volume count there's lots of solutions out there that are being added into projects that work great with 100 users but what if you have 100,000 users suddenly there's a tipping point that those projects mm -hmm. fall over and die um, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying that the solution specialists would necessarily know that that tipping point's going to be there but they should be there to say oh by the way before we, we before this even gets to staging we should do some load testing against it yeah no I totally agree it, it's funny actually really the solution specialist is going to be the most it's going to be the person with the most scars and wounds from past experience who is leveraging like oh kind of what you just said right you find out on the on your first project oh yeah scalability i should be thinking about that you pay the dumb tax right you get you get punched in the face over that then the next project you're the first guy in the meeting that's like wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute hold on <laughs> like how many SKUs do you have how many customers do you have um, no, I think that's, that's exactly right. Yeah, that solution specialist in a lot of ways is going to be uh, maybe not the most technically experienced person as part of the delivery team, but probably the most technically experienced person on the, on the like project oversight, right? The, 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 the person sort of representing uh, maybe the broadest experience of like how other people have solved problems, what's worked well, what's not worked well. Um, that's, that's something that it's that, that little voice of experience when you got, you know, they're still wearing band-aids the last project, you know? Yeah. And asking questions of the developers and giving pushback on things that they'd like to do. And, uh, you know, I can think of an example where we wanted to do it, some migration and, and some developers said, well, no, because of this, we can't do a automatic migration. And I said, why, why can't we import it and then make sure that the post post uh, data manipulation is done or why can't we even modify and do that as part of our migration why can't we manipulate that data as part of it rather than doing a copy and paste for a thousand records which is what the what the team leader was was proposing i think that at least asking a question and making everybody think rather than going and just doing is is one of the is one of those important roles that we don't talk about and again, I'm just gonna keep going back to taking a breath and letting everybody have some space to do some planning and thinking and then reanalysis. So we're not rushing through everything quickly. No, totally agree. And that means that you're, whoever is filling that role probably needs to be less leveraged on than maybe a project company is, right? A lot of project managers have six, seven, eight, ten 10 projects going at one time. You can't take a breath and slow down about any one of them because there's a there's a status call starting right for the next one so but, but you know you're whoever's doing that probably needs to be like have that space right to sit and think about the problem instead of just reacting i completely agree um in your role do you have any say so on how the developers are doing their environments do you ever do you go to that part of it or in that role do you or in your role do you mainly focus on the solution I'm the, I'm the engineering manager at MPC for the Magento team. So, um, but really that, that, that means all of everything that touches Magento kind of like rolls, rolls into my inbox or my Slack at some level. Um, I'm not a developer. Um, I've never been a developer. So I, what I, what I do is trust the senior developers that I have to make those decisions and provide input. Because one of the things you pick up from several years of hanging around with the developers are approaches and tools that have worked and haven't. And I had the really good fortune to spend, you know, almost four years at, at Classic Llama with guys like David Alger and Eric Hansen, who were really like, you know, David, of course, building Warden and continuing to maintain it, even though he's, he's exited the ecosystem. 
you just pick up a lot hanging around really smart people. Um, and there's a lot of openness in the Magento community, right? On, on Twitter, uh, especially. And so you've got a lot of people with opinions and a lot of people with experience freely sharing information. It can be um, contentious at times. Some, you know, there's, there's, nobody's more opinionated than the developer talking about their, uh, their local environment. Um, but yeah, I would say I have a say and have actually, you know, pushed for some changes in how we manage things. But um, I wouldn't say that it's like coming in with a vision so much as facilitating a dialogue, right? And, and letting people be open. Because the truth is too, I mean, at a, at a, at a large agency, you have a mix of full-time employees and contractors at varying degrees of remove from how you operate, right? How your IT organization provisions devices. And so if I have a contractor on for, you know, two months, well, I'm not, I don't have a lot of, you know, impact into how that person sets up their local environment. I can only say, we'll support you if you use X and Y. And if you want to like, hey, I'm building my own Linux tower and running, you know, uh, my own sort of like custom stack, if you're an experienced developer, okay, I just can't help you if it goes bonk, right? That's the, that's, that's really the line I feel like I, we have to draw. It's, it's about focus and, and resources. So we, we use Warden pretty heavily, but we've done, you know, ballet um, and, uh, you know, various vagrant configurations and things like that over the years. Uh, I know there are some, some folks that are doing no local environments and they're just doing AWS instances, right? I think there's some agencies and you guys might be one of them. Uh, I know of a couple of others uh, in the Midwest who, who do that. Um, and I haven't, and I think that's an interesting idea um, that might be worth pursuing one of these days. But yeah, just try to keep the dialogue going, right? Because it's always changing and improving. It's not like you can do things the way that you did it five years ago, it won't work. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I, I had a really great interview with Aaron Moss, who, who has a, a, a thing called MDoc right now, where mm -hmm. it's basically a developer can spin up any environment they want in any project in 15 minutes and have it working. Oh, wow. Um, so I, I think those type of things, those sort of SaaS based solutions or, or remote solutions are, are the future. Um, I think Docker, I think Warden is also a great, a great, uh, solution to it. Um, I, I agree that now the complexity of Magento is making it more difficult to do, um, a local environment. However, you know, I, I've run, I, I'm a pretend developer, like mm -hmm. I like. I like to at least know how to get it running. And so Valet Plus was my go-to. Uh, the only problem I guess with that is that every time you upgrade your your Mac, it kills your whole Valet setup and you have to go through that, yep. um, which doesn't make it easy either for any new developer who's trying to get that. And I think the biggest problem in those setting up local environments are that every one of those developers it, their machine's a little different and it takes them some time. And if you rush somebody into a project, like if you have some need to add on extra people and th those people have to get onboarded, that learning cycle has to happen every time. So uh, I think the Docker for local is probably the best solution uh, in terms of trying to mimic something as a remote environment. But of course, having it in a remote environment is also a great solution. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's, it's always, I, I think it's, it is the topic of now and, and it's very interesting to see how things are playing out in the community. Yeah, totally agree. And to answer your question about, we are definitely a mixture of working uh, mainly in MAMP or uh, a lot of our developers are on Linux machines, so they just run everything locally. Uh, but again, then you have to know something about Linux and not every developer wants to know the full stack and not every developer wants to care about all that stuff. So some developers just want to develop. And I think as you move to more front end developers, they are more uh, hesitant to learn about, well, why do I have to run MySQL in my local box? And how do I get this running? And what is, uh, you know, what is this service? What is Redis and why do I need it? And blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Oh, totally agree. Well, it's interesting, and you mentioned the front-end developers. Um, obviously, the Magento front-end experience is is being revolutionized pretty rapidly now with, with PWA, Whova, 
Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, headless with Adobe Experience Manager in the front. Uh, a lot of like sort of omnibus Adobe deals that have you know both both applications, both both monoliths uh, deployed, um, which complicates it even more because now you've got you know potentially a totally separate front end stack that is not even on the same box, right? With different different technologies on it than what you're running Magento on, and so now you've got two developer environments to maintain, right? And and two two things to support. What is um, what are you guys seeing on the on the front end side? I know you've been uh, you've talked about PWA, uh, you know, in the past. I know both of us have. Um, obviously, Hoover is sort of exploding onto the scene now. What are what's your what's your take on on all of this? Yeah, we were early adopter of PWA, but it's been hard to get traction behind. And I feel as though Adobe should be incentivizing us as us as agencies to really push PWA. I don't feel like there's a big incentive for anybody to do it right now other than to do it. And it is, you have to have a different type of developer. There's a different stack. It is more complicated in the end, but in the end it, it should be simpler if you have a React developer and they can do it on Magento. Uh, we are also embracing Hoova, Hoofa, Haifa, however you pronounce it. Um, it is definitely the topic. I am I'm interviewing Willem uh, and I'm gonna get the definitive way of pronouncing it. That's gonna be maybe the whole, the whole interview is just gonna be how do you pronounce it? But regardless, um, I'm excited about that. I wish it was an open source project. We're, we're, we have a um, we have a, a client that we're going to be doing a B two B project on, and the mm -hmm. developers came back and said, "Well, there's nothing that's here for B two B. Like everything we're going to do has to be new, newly developed. So what do we do? Okay, well we have to figure out how are we going to you know are we going to just charge for the client and then hold that code? Is is Wagenda going to hold on to all that code we build out for for B two B, or should we give it back?" You know, right. I think that's a really, that's a something that from a paid something do you're paying, you know, the, the license is a thousand dollars, which is really nothing, but uh, then do we wait for them to develop B2B or, you know, I think that's, if it was just open source, like a lot of these things, it would be, it would be easier, but I also understand the need for them to recoup on their investment. It's funny. We're in the exact same. Um, and went ahead and, and so we've got um, a couple of large projects starting uh, now um, and they are not PWA. Okay? We thought about PWA, but kind of to your point, starting with the PWA conversation, I agree with everything you said. And, and I've been at the sort of the bleeding edge of PWA, sort of like from a, from a developer standpoint and a solutioning standpoint, hey, this is cool, let's see what's happening. What I think, what I have not seen is the market actually asking for it. There's no demand. It is, it is very much a solution in search of a problem. And I would say that the problem, the problem is Magento 2's native front end stack sucks. It's always sucked. But the long-term direction, the long-term solution for this, which is really not PWA, it's really headless, right? If you, if you press on the PWA engineering effort at Adobe, what you really find is GraphQL endpoints, right? It's not like, I mean, it's certainly right with, there's a VE reference theme, there's all of the, there's, there's the upward uh, spec, there's, there's all of the other tooling around it. Um, it took them so long for their cloud solution to support PWA frankly, which just torpedoed sales efforts because for a long time, because, you know, Adobe wants to sell cloud, but you would have to buy a separate hosting for a long time at the beginning if you wanted PWA because they wouldn't host it. They, they were like, oh, we're not going to put React on our platform.msh like provision AWS instance, right? Um, now that that problem has been gone, but I have, I, I still don't have merchants asking for it, right? I, it, I think the education isn't there as to why anyone should care and it represents extra complexity. And at the end of the day, complexity is a subsidy, right? Complexity is only going to be accessible to larger merchants with larger budgets who are willing to have like a separate IT stat, right? For their front end. Okay, well then you have to justify it because the 
the native front end sucks. Like it's not a good reason, right? It's not a reason to sort of like move your storefront over there. Um, but the headless direction is I think exactly where Adobe is going, right? And 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 I think Hoova is gonna be what we're what we're evaluating as an engineering group is making Hoova our default front end. So we we purchased a license, we're evaluating it now for some very large, very large consumer uh, brands that I can't identify. Uh, on the call, but, uh, and we're pretty impressed. Um, you know, if you, what you do is you make a, you build a compatibility module. So if there's a Magento module that does not have Hoopa coverage, you build a compatibility module to align it with, with, with the Hoopa theme. And if there's, um, you know, my, my engineering team lead has sort of like been leading the effort on that. He was, he was telling, telling me yesterday that, really the level of effort is around how much JavaScript there is in the module. If there's not much JavaScript in the module, Hoover compatibility is pretty easy. There is a lot of JavaScript. There's a lot of knockout involved. You're going to have, you're going to have a, a time rewriting it. But to your point, in theory, your compatibility module should be code that you can apply to more multiple projects because you're, you're making the native platform, you know, operate within Hoover. So yeah, it's us. We're going to build those compatibility modules and probably like reuse them. If there's a way for us to give them back, we will. Since it's not open source, I can't just submit a PR to Will, right? And be like, here, here, here you go. Um, so I'd be interested in your interview with him to, to hear what he's thinking. But for, for now, for us, if a deal doesn't come in with AEM sort of like specified or PWA specified, we're just going to like assume Hoova and probably deal with the extra effort that, that, in, that it's involved in making it compatible. Because I think it's very early stage right now in another year, the same like, hey, it doesn't work for B2B. Oh, there's no gift cards. There's no gift options for gift wrap and whatever. Like that'll be solved. Like those guys are going to solve that problem. We will have solved it or the Hoova guys will have solved it. And uh, it's such a faster, lighter weight solution. It's such an obvious upgrade in performance over Luma that I think it's worth the pain up front. Yeah, I would agree with that too. John Hughes is another big uh, user or proponent of it. And I know he has a page builder uh, yes. uh, compatibility uh, solution that's out there. The other, uh, the other thing is that developers are sometimes hesitant to ask other developers for some of these things. And it takes somebody like a solution specialist to say, are you in the Slack channel? Have you asked anybody any questions about this solution? Because um, the same, that, that, that exact thing saying came up and said, oh, we have this whole project now. It's, it's on Hoover. Uh, but none of the page builder things work. What do we do? I'm like, well, have you seen the the what John Hughes is doing? Have you asked John any questions? He would love to answer those questions. So I'm hoping the long-term solution is that we start giving some of this code back to uh, to Willem or IntegerNet and that they this code that starts monolithing into some solution that works for everybody and that people join the Slack channel and start talking about what are the things that we need. And I would say one thing that he could really use is um, a, a way of requesting specific things as I went in and said, is there, a, is there a place for X? I think it was page builder or, or B2B. And he said, just ask in the requirements or whatever channel, I don't remember what channel it was, but you know, there are going to be specific things that we need out of that and that a place to get those things and maybe bubble up people that would like to collaborate on some community-based items is going to be important in that. Yeah, I totally agree. There's a Slack, there's a Hoover Slack, go, go get in it. Yep. Follow John on Twitter, follow, follow Willem on Twitter. Like there's, there's plenty of, there's activity there. It's that community, it's that community awareness part of the solution, especially is it's so important. And we don't have Ben Marks to do it for that anymore, so. Right, he's, he's, our, he's our new uh, Magneto. That's right, that's right. And, and Matt Boland is gone too. We don't get happenings every, every week, so. I know. Uh, it's a, or, well, or one after one. Yeah, all, you could go to Ultra Commerce and get happenings now. I'm not. I'm not at Ultra Commerce, and I'm getting happenings about Ultra Commerce. Are you? I'm finding yeah, it. Very I get them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dude, kept Absolutely. His lift. I like. Yeah, they're, uh, and they're on Adobe Spark, so that's even better. I know. 
I know. Great. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you a question. Yeah, go ahead. Last, since we last talked, you got acquired. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, thank you. So I, I, and I, I'm not familiar with with eWay, um, and I'd love to hear. There's, there's, um, I think what Kaylin just tweeted about it the other day. Is sort of the rising, you know, tide of, of M and A activity in the ecosystem. It's a long story. Kayla's as old as time at this point, but I would just be curious, you know, um, what you you've had its tremendous growth at Legento over the last five years that I that I've sort of like you know known you and Susan and and, and sort of paid attention to the to every, other other folks in the ecosystem. Uh, your global expansion has been like really interesting to watch the way you've moved into other markets. Um, so it seemed very logical for an acquisition, right? Given 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 where you're taking the business, um, what's uh, what's changed? What's what's different for 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 Brent? I know Su Susan's no longer. Uh, Correct. Yeah, Susan has left oh. and is semi-retired for at least six months. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I think we both agreed that we're not quite old enough yet to retire, or we're not ready. So. Um, right. Uh, and I'm, I've been promoted to president of Wagenta, which was Susan's old title. And, uh, and so I'm helping run mainly sales and marketing now. So what's changed, uh, the biggest thing that has changed for me is that I, I'm not putting my hands into operations. I'm not putting my hands into project management anymore. Some of those other, you know, sort of uh, gritty things that I'm not part of, I'm, I'm trying to put my my head around uh, how to do some marketing efforts and and how to do some maybe talent helping in talent acquisition for more of a sales and, en and engineering side or sales engineering not sales and but or sales or but sales and engineering so finding people that are talented both technically and can sort of speak speak a little bit about it to clients so client facing roles let's just put it there and then um uh, our goals are, are are around sort of moving into the Latin American market. We we moved there early. You know, we we opened an office in Bolivia in 2014, right. and uh, with the idea that hurt. oh, everybody speaks Spanish, we'll easily sell in Mexico. And then we found out oh, Mexicans are it's a different culture than Bolivia. <laughs> so yeah, we moved into officially we opened up uh, or we we incorporated in Bolivia in 2018 and. And we had some fantastic growth. We were we ran second uh, to another firm for sales and uh, for enterprise level sales in 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 Mexico in 2018. And um, uh, it's it's really been a good a good ride and good experience. And you know some some of my core core goals or core uh, values are that if we are in that market, if we have an office in Bolivia, we are selling in Bolivia. We were the first agency to sell an enterprise solution in Bolivia. So that that type of thing we're doing, we're selling in India. You know, we have clients in India that are buying Adobe products. So it's not just, a, it's not, it is not just, it is not even an outsource model. In fact, we, we had a very large client in India that we used resources from Mexico to help them on their design side. And I think some of that talent and mixing up that talent has been a big asset to us and then always for me i always just fighting that idea that this is just an outsource these guys in in far off lands are just outsourced people that are there to do code and not to do solutions right no completely completely agree it is definitely something that my perspective has changed on as well coming from mostly north america based smaller smaller us based agencies um to moving now, you know, Dentsu, we're one of the top Adobe partners in the world. There's, you know, many, there, there are offices on every continent except Antarctica. Like it's, um, it's such a, time zones are a challenge for calls, uh, but it's such a, it's such a different world and seeing how it, how the business operates in different markets is, is been really interesting to, to watch. And so, and I, I, one of the things when I came on, I thought of you because I, you were one of the, like I said, one of the early adopters of that. I'm like, I wonder, I wonder what Brent's experience has been. So thanks for thanks for sharing that. Yeah, no, it's. I mean, I think that we've had we we were very lucky and have a high like we had a lot of communications between. We we adopted Slack really early, so everybody was talking to everybody. 
uh, there was full access to the, every team member across any region and time zone. So I, all that helped, you know, some of the things that you think about client facing like extreme lots of communications, we do that backwards to to so employees can feel that as well. And then we've we've adopted a system. Um, it's called EOS entrepreneur operating system. It's just a kind of a way of doing business. Everybody is in a meeting every week. So it doesn't sound as bad as it sounds, but everybody has a voice. So anybody in the in any meeting can bubble up an issue to the to the top level meeting. So again, giving voice to everybody in the in the organization. And the new company eWay has embraced this model of how we're doing business. They're, they are mainly in public sector and higher ed. So we, we don't, we have completely different types of clients. So it's been a good fit. Um, and um, it's been a, it's been an interesting, well, it's been, an, it's been four months. So it's been an interesting four months. <laughs> yeah, that. Well, congratulations again on, on the uh, accomplishment. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we have, we have a few minutes left. Um, what, uh, what are you doing to keep yourself up to speed on Adobe? What sort of tools and books are you reading? Um, you know, uh, there's really two sort of main vehicles for that. Um, we have at, at, at Dinsu, uh, there is an Adobe uh, platform leadership team. And uh, we meet, there is at least one meeting every week, sometimes multiple meetings, meetings of leaders from every business division within Dentsu who, who touch the Adobe Alliance, right? And so that's every Adobe product, not just, not just um, Magento. There's really only one or two of us who are sort of representing Magento inside of the larger Adobe ecosystem. It's, it's interesting how small we are really compared to the rest of the revenue globally for all like you know, AAM and analytics, you know, form of Omniture and, and all of the other products that they have. Um, so there's a lot of knowledge sharing though, that goes on. There's, you know, somebody usually comes in and does like a, like a tech talk or a, a presentation of some kind. We have vendors come in sometimes and, and, and talk about that. So there's a lot of education and, uh, work with the sort of larger Adobe ecosystem. There's a lot of information that filters in through that. And then honestly, the rest of it is just Twitter. Um, I did do, uh, uh since a little bit of summit this year, uh, I'm not, a, I'll be honest, I'm not a fan of the virtual events. Like it's hard, it's hard to give a damn about a webinar when your day is all Zoom calls. Um, like, yeah, I'm gonna, gonna, I'm totally paying attention to this session while I'm doing work, you know, cause the emails keep coming in and Slack messages keep coming in. It's like, you don't get the focus, you don't get the networking. Also did the, uh, the Gender Association Connect, which was, um, a little bit more focused, honestly, um, and uh, same challenge, right, with doing a virtual event, but trying to stay up on the virtual events, and just waiting for the in-person stuff to come back so we can all get together and like have too much to drink and talk about Magento, maybe maybe do a run of some kind uh, in a scenic location. Um, and, uh, but yeah, Twitter is honestly like the best place to go for like, like the, the attention span starved person that I am where there's not a lot of focus time in between meetings to go to go do things. So I'm just gonna pull up Twitter and see what what's going on. And it actually works surprisingly well because you it at least spark something that you can file away to follow up on later when you do have more time. Uh, yeah. What That's about you? Uh, I, I again use Twitter and then I'm using uh, well, I listen to some podcasts. You know, Mage Talk is always it was a good one when it was out there. Right, good, but, yeah, but when good. it was out there regularly, um, and then I guess just trying to keep in touch with all all the Magento people that are out there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, a good, yeah, Twitter is probably the is is the main place that I use to get to collect my information. I publish a lot of information on LinkedIn. I wouldn't say mm -hmm. LinkedIn from Magento or Adobe standpoint is the best place to get it. Right. Um, we also do, we, we do uh, um, once a month where somebody gives a presentation about a topic, call it First Fridays. It typically happens on the first Friday of the month, hence the name. And somebody will do a presentation around a topic uh, that, that would be, you know, for the whole organization. We record it and then it's published uh, 
Uh, but I think you're right. Twitter and and I guess talking to partners and maybe doing some webinars with some of our partners helps as well to get yourself educated on what's out there and what's happening. Yeah. Um, I did see uh, uh, an article that was written from Adobe's, maybe it was their CMO that said maybe 2022 won't be even a time where we're in in-person events come back, which I think, you know, I don't know what perspective they're getting from. Maybe they're not sitting in front of the camera or in front of the computer for all this time doing these, watching these webinars. But I absolutely have to say in-person events have to happen again and they should happen soon. I went to a conference in Austin about four weeks ago uh, in person. Oh, wow. And uh, then a week later, I went to a, a running conference in Florida. So they are happening. The yep. one in Austin was a sort of a hybrid thing where they did, uh, it was 80 people and we got all got together in small groups, but went into a big session where we watched a main pres presenter on, on the big screen. So I, okay. I believe the hybrid events are what's going to happen. And I think it's going to make our lives better too, because we can, if we can't make Meet Magenta Poland, but we're interested in a topic about Meet Magenta Poland, I would like it to have those events now, uh, both in person and virtual. And I don't know how the organizers, and I guess we're an organizer, but I don't know how the organizers are going to figure out the monetary portion of it that, uh, you know, does it make sense to charge somebody in person and give the streaming person free? I'm going to say yes. Uh, but that gives us the ability to both be there and, and if you'd like to be there in person, go. But if you can't, then you could see it streamed live. I think that's the kind of exciting thing. And we're, we're hoping to do some of that type of thing in the future. Um, in fact, I, I have a little plug. Um, we are, I am promoting an event that I would like to do in January, 2022 for an Adobe hackathon. So just like we do a hackathons at all these bigger events, like me, Magento India, we had a hackathon. It was completely virtual for two years in a row. We've done a virtual hackathon. Um, I want to do an in-person hackathon in Orlando, Florida in January, January of 2022. And maybe it would be mix up a hackathon and, and maybe a small meet Magento or meetup type of thing where we can get together and talk about some topics. I, I like the idea of an unconference. So Mage Unconference is a fantastic event and maybe a hackathon unconference would be the solution for us to do where we cap it. Maybe it's capped at 120 people like Mage Unconference is. But then there's that other ability to kind of relax and unwind and go to, if you like Disney World, go to there, or like Universal Studios, go to there. Or, you know, you want to just get to Florida in January. Uh, you're, that, you're, that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah, you're in Springfield, but we're in Minnesota. So anywhere other than here in January sometimes looks appealing. It really does. I've, I've wanted to have a Meet Magenta Midwest for a long time because there are there are a lot of like there's there there's a lot more magenta there are a lot more magenta people in the Midwest depending on how you define it uh, than there were even three or four years ago. Um, and I think you can get some some interest. I would not want to do it in January. I will tell you right. that. Now after winter we just no. yeah absolutely no. yeah Meet Magenta Midwest in Key Largo. How about that? yeah perfect. I love that idea. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I think Magento. I, I I also attended a Magento Connect, and I did. I enjoyed it. I thought it was good content. It would be would be better in in person. And uh, I guess one other comment that I'll make is that uh, in the Magento community, Hufa or Haifa is is giving some uh, energy to the community, and it's giving us something to talk about. And and. I like the the topics that are coming out about Magento and about the front end and how, hey, this front end has been dead for 10 or five years now. And we, this is something new that's helping us as a, as a, as a community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, com completely agree on that. It's, it's, it's refreshing to have some energy. Um, and it's refreshing to have the energy where it's, even though Hula is not open source itself, it's, it's not gated behind an Adobe contract. It's more accessible to a larger group of people. If you want to say, hey, what friend do I want to build on? Uh, PWA Studio is the same way. Um, but Whova makes a lot of sense, I think, for, for some, you know, it's certainly like 
the smaller mid-market merchants who have historically made up the bulk of, of, of Magento adoption. Whova is just such an obvious like solution for those folks. And there's been frankly so little product change in the open source version of Magento for so long. It's like, oh my God, we have something to talk about. And it's, yeah, yeah it's great. Yeah, exactly. Good. Well, this is uh, this has been a good uh, thirty minutes. I know we've gone forty five minutes in our thirty minutes, but uh, you know it's been a great we'll conversation. Oh. Um, is there a, what? Well, give yourself a shameless plug about anything you'd like. Okay. Well, um, I'll do a shameless plug for uh, a sport. How about that? Um, I don't even see behind me. I, my image is reversed. I've been into fencing for the last couple of years. Uh, got into it. Um, yeah, I figure like you're never too old to learn something new. Um, and it, I started getting into fencing right before COVID. Um, so and it, so it was good timing because it's a sport that requires you to wear a mask and then when people get close to you, you stab them. Um, and so it's it's very like appropriate for the times we live in. But uh, very niche, very niche sport, right? Like not a lot of people uh, or niche sport. I need to say that Philip, uh, Phil Jackson just had a poll on this. I'm not sure how, now that he did a poll, I don't know how to say if it's niche, niche, niche. I'm unclear how to say it, but it's a very small sport appealing to a very small group of people. And I've been having a blast with it. And I think more people should get into it. It is a lot of fun. Um, it works for all levels of athleticism, um, but you, it's a good sort of like mental and physical um, like a martial art, but uh, you're unlikely to actually get hurt um, doing it unless somebody is very enthusiastic with their repay. Um, but so, yeah, I would, in fact, if we could do, uh, I'd be happy to like say, well, uh, I'd be happy to organize like a Magento fencing event. I think that would be a lot of fun. Um, and maybe the next in-person meetup we go, of course, you know, we are lots of protective gear um, so very safe for, for, for pandemics. Uh, and then we all just try to stab each other for fun and uh, maybe raise some money for charity. I think it would be a fun thing to do. But uh, I want to evangelize fencing. I think it's a great sport. I think more people should get into it. Um, and I would love to have some people to fence with uh, at the next uh, Magento, uh, Magento meetup. Yeah, I love that. Mage fence, we'll call it. Mage fencing. Perfect. Perfect. I'm perfect. Sure yeah. It is surely available, right? Yeah. My, my son in, has embraced jujitsu which is uh, mm -hmm. not at all like fencing. You grapple and you get really close to people and you break fingers. So mm -hmm. there's, and he has very long hair. So people pull on his hair sometimes too. So uh, um, uh, yeah, I think this, this has been an opportunity for everybody to explore uh, new opportunities, hopefully for physicalness. I'm a very mm -hmm. big proponent of getting out and moving and I uh, the picture behind you yes yeah yeah um so uh th that's great Ma mage fencing i love that good all right aaron it's been great a great conversation um uh, we'll, we'll follow up and if there's any show notes you want me to you want to send me if you, uh, that'd be great uh, but uh, this will be published in a week or two and i enjoyed the conversation i hope to see you soon at an, an event in person that would be fantastic. Thanks for thanks for your time. Yep, absolutely. Have a great day. You too. Magento Creative, partnering with the client to help fulfill their strategic growth, serving the world as an Adobe Gold partner and Big Commerce Elite partner. Magento, the code of commerce. This episode has been sponsored by the partner of choice for technology, infrastructure, and enterprise level digital solutions, an AWS Select Consulting Partner, EWA Corporation, Forward Together. Thank you again for listening. My name is Brent Peterson, and it has been my pleasure to be your host today. Please rate and subscribe to Talk Commerce, new shows out every week.